Good day. Welcome back. And I believe you are all revising the previous day's sessions and you are getting familiar with the Cortex M4 series of different uh, registers, different peripherals. And I believe you would have gone through by now uh, the functional block diagram. So you are familiar about the different bus systems, etc. If not, please go back, watch the videos and revise yourself so you'll get uh, more in-depth knowledge. Today is day 8 and please welcome back and let's get in to see what day 8 unfolds for us. Today we're going to learn about memory map and bus interface of Cortex-MX processor. What are all the things that's involved in memory map and what are all it involved in uh, bus interface? That's we're going to learn today. So these are all the sections we will cover. Memory map, so how and where memory map is used and uh, uh, what is its um, values and its address. And the microcontroller bus interface, what are all the different bus interfaces that you will be using, the um, advanced hype performance bus and advanced uh, peripheral bus um, likewise so you will be learning what uh, buses are there in cortex m4 and the next one is the mcu clock the microcontroller clock there are three there are uh, different types of clocks and you will be learning about what they are so let's get in and uh, learn today before moving in, I would like to give you a short introduction about uh, whom I am representing. I am representing A2DG, as you can see. It's a startup company by Anbukarasu Brothers. My brother Alex and myself, Farul, started in 2023. Both of us have 20 plus years of experience working in the industry, and we would really, really like to share our experience and our knowledge to you all so that it will be helpful to you to shape up and uh, be a better professional engineer in the end. Our mission is to convey our, share, our ex shared experience and knowledge to at least 100,000 future professionals out there through our online courses. And the one big advantage is you can do this study at your own pace, at your own time, wherever you are. So that's really good. About me, I am Arul Prakash Anbukarasu. You can call me as Arul or APA as popularly as I would like to be. <laughs> okay, jokes apart. I have 12, 20 plus years of experience working in Australia. I came here back in 2003 and did my uh, master's majoring in embedded systems, VLSA in project management. Since then, I've been working here concentrating on major industries, mainly in renewable energy sector that's dealt with uh, solar and wind, power systems that dealt with lead acid batteries. Then there is the network embedded systems where the automatic teller machines, the um, teller cash registers, a point of sales. Uh, those are all the network embedded systems that I have hands-on worked almost all the embedded uh, development lifecycle in each and every company and banking automation systems and uh, smart parking operations. So my main expertise is on all the three, embedded systems, VLSA and project management. This is what I would like to share with you, my experience and my journey, how I uh, went about so that you will learn in an easy way. You don't have to do the hard way by um, uh, trying it all by yourself, but through my teaching, it will uh, get you into that first step in the ladder and you can uh, climb very soon. I got a small announcement to make. I have categorized into two different uh, categories. There is the YouTube viewers and uh, the internship professionals. The YouTube viewers, all the video sessions that I'm handling now, I'll be loading into my A2DG YouTube channel. You please go there and watch all the videos in order to be eligible to get a e-certificate you have to attend at least 28 classes and that um, gets you an e-certificate 
but due to some regulations from YouTube, the videos can't live there forever, so it has to be removed after two or three days. So if you miss a day, you can't go back and uh, revise or catch up. So that's the drawback. So please, I would advise strongly and I would recommend you to join our internship program. By joining our internship program, it will get you and acquire your internship certificates. And that's worth a lot. I give this example. So when you go into the interview or when once you got the job, first job, and you are in the industry working with the team, your knowledge and your experience will sit among the top. So no, no one in the industry need to give you um, um, prior uh, teaching, learning experience in there because you spend this 30 days and you learned everything. So you will be ready to go whatever uh, project you will face in the industry. So. Uh, the senior engineers and the managers will be so thankful that you already uh, done this. So it reduces their part a bit. Not only that, you will get a separate login to only access to you through our uh, learning management system portal. You can log in and you can go through our uh, daily session. Um, and once you finish, you have to click complete and continue. And that will cover us your attendance for that day or for that session. Not only that, you can access to all the course contents unlimited. So anytime, anywhere, you can go back again and you can revise and recap. Uh, you can read it and rewatch it. And also the course contents, it's unlimited. You can pause it, you can uh, rewind or you can fast forward. You can come back, uh, do all sorts of things. Also, if you got stuck somewhere in the middle, please contact our backend team and they would be able to help you to move you along through the course. And these are all the materials required for uh, learning. Um, Hands-on experience is the key here. So the more you practice, so the more you have your hands on the hardware, the more experience, more knowledge you will gain. So please contact Pantex Solutions down there and they are the manufacturing company and they would be able to assist you to acquire all of this. So you need to have all of this to learn this Cortex M4 series also, after you finish learning, you can use all of this and you can create your own projects. You can create your own design. So um, it is a worthy investment, which doesn't stop here. It, you can take it to other projects as well. So please, please, um, the investment that you're going to make today will help you for your future. So please go ahead and uh, contact Pantech Solutions and they would be able to help you to acquire all of that. Today it's going to be a um, bit of a theoretical and I'm going to explain the program, just a short program to show um, what it is. Um, to go through with me, you need all these five documents. What it is, it's the STM32F411 data sheet that I um, referred to you yesterday or the day before the sessions. An STM32F411 reference manual and the schematics when um, you learned about the blinking LED and controlling the switch. I sent you links. Uh, when you go there, you can download the schematics links. And the new thing is you need to download Nucleo user manual. And I'm going to refer that to another microcontroller from Texas Instruments to compare between the STM32 and uh, the Texas Instruments microcontrollers. So if you haven't, um, uh, got any of this please download and uh, it will be really helpful to go through with me so please have all these documents handy I'm sure you are keen like me to get in to explore what these are all about um, so let's get going not to waste any time so let's get in before um, uh, giving you elaborate explanation, I would like to start today from uh, a basic architecture. You would have learned this through your engineering curriculum um, over the years, but I'm just recapping for you. Any microcontroller that you are using or you used or you're going to use will be in under one of these two architectures. So this is the basic architecture. As you maybe also know the name Von Neumann and Harvard, what is the difference between the two Von Neumann and Howard? In Von Neumann architecture, 
the CPU, the arithmetic logic unit, the control unit, the registers, uh, they are all connected via the same bus to both the data memory RAM and the program memory ROM. What this limits is, if you want to say you want to get data from um, or uh, fetch an instruction at program memory, and also at the same time, if you want to get to data memory, you can't do that. You can either get data memory or you can get program memory. Whereas the Harvard is uh, really versatile. So all the CPU, ALU, CU in Harvard architecture connect to the data memory and program memory on a different bus. In other words, if you want to simultaneously fetch something from the data memory and also from program memory, you can do so with only Harvard architecture. So that's why uh, this is a much preferred architecture because you can do multiple things, whereas one human you can't because um, this slows down the process because you keep using the same bus. So there will be a network traffic in there. So um, the architecture that we learning in this series is STM32 F411 and that is based on Howard architecture. So I thought to give you a touch base uh, in regards to architecture so it would help you to learn um, the basic difference. So when you go to writing your own um, program, then these things will come to your mind and you would be able to easily understand and write your codes. So let's get into the memory map of the microcontroller unit, uh, the STM32 F411. That's a microcontroller that we are using. It's based on um, ARM Cortex M4 processor. Um, so it is. It has the basic architecture with um, uh, the processor is STM32 F411. The board that uh, I showed you the other class is um, STM32 F411 nuclear board. And the architecture we are using is the ARM Cortex M4. And the width of the system bus is 32 bits. As you learned yesterday, uh, these are the 32 bits. So what that is, you can access to two power 32 different addresses. So that will take you to four gigabytes of um, different addresses that you can access. So the range of addresses for this memory map would start from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, so this is the range of address for any memory map, um, so be it a flash memory or a static RAM, anything, It everything will have its unique um, address. So you need to go to the memory map to follow that. Before going to the memory map, I would like to highlight with you about the functional block diagram. So you will have a better understanding about um, um, the various peripherals for a start. As I said earlier in the previous classes, so the functional block diagram lives in STM32 F411 data sheet on page 15. Uh, this is the functional block diagram. If you uh, downloaded the manual, uh, the data sheet, this is the one you'll get. And if you zoom in to that part, that's the one we're going to learn about today. And this is what you will see. So this is the um, uh, the uh, memory section and this is the bus section so this is the one we're going to learn about today i will show you from the data sheet itself just uh, one moment um, i'll go to data sheet and going to page 15. so this is the functional block diagram as um, you would have downloaded already and uh, you would come to this and this is the one we are um, we already knew earlier so this is the one i'm going to show you again so we are talking about the uh, bus interface and the memory map today so the bus interface is connected if you want to um, uh, uh, connect to the peripherals microcontroller is all about connecting with peripheral so when you want to communicate you need to have a peripheral with the help of the peripheral you can uh, communicate and talk to the other devices so likewise the peripherals and everything will be connected via a bus 
so the ports also are connected by a via a bus and arm cortex m4 runs on 100 megahertz what that 100 megahertz is the operating frequency so every microcontroller again you have to refer the data sheet will have its operating frequency operating frequency is the bus frequency so arm cortex m4 that we are learning throughout now runs on 100 megahertz and this arm microcontroller is connected to the ahb bus matrix the ahb bus matrix is ahb stands for advanced high performance bus matrix and if you dig deep into that the, it's connected to ahb1 advanced bus high performance bus 1 and if you still dig deep into that the advanced uh, high b1 is connected to what you see is uh, two divisions so this is um, called a bridge uh, you can call us a bridge circuit or a bridge uh, bus where it divides into two different sections so this is where it um, uh, concentrates on high speed and low, low speed uh, peripherals so if you want to use anything high speed uh, peripherals then uh, you have to go to APB2 which is advanced peripheral 2 and that runs on 100 megahertz speed and if you want to do anything on a lower frequency then um, APB1 is a 50 megahertz so these are the low frequency bus for example if you want to program for a new sort or um, SP2 or I2C3 then you got to enable the APB1 first and then write programs accordingly to the registers whereas if you want to access to all the ports that you learned from the previous sessions to blink an LED and control the switch then you need to come to the AHB1 and you need to enable that clock and also moving uh, to here it, it has um, every microcontroller has the um, uh, clock without clock it's very um, uh, it's hard to program so clock is the one which uh, connects with all the peripherals and it, it synchronizes with every each and every peripherals with the help of clock so there is a circuitry which has provide all the clocks so the H clock that comes out that goes into the um, HB bus clock the A APB2 clock and APB B1 they are the peripheral bus clocks so uh, for these two peripherals and AHB B1 P clock and AHB B2 they are all for um, the high performance AHB1 and AHB2 is for those so this is about the bus peripherals as you can see if you want to interface high speed um, uh, sensors then you need to choose APB2 or if you want to interface with uh, low speed then APB1 uh, runs on a 50 megahertz for example if you want to use a USB um, in your uh, program if you want to write code then that means um, you can't access HB1 it is connected directly to HB2 and it runs again on 100 megahertz so you need to enable this bus so that uh, you tell the microcontroller that um, it's coming through the HB2 bus and when we talk about the memory mapping you can see here there is three different buses um, ARM Cortex M4 has three different buses what are they they are the D bus I bus and S bus D bus is nothing but data bus I bus is nothing but instruction bus S bus is nothing but system bus if you want to access to flash memory then you can access via both the data bus and uh, instruction bus you can't access to flash memory via a system bus it's not connected but if you want to access to instruction set on the um, static RAM then it can be connected through the system bus you can't access the instruction via the data bus and I bus on the SRAM whereas for flash these two buses are used so this the uh, these are all the uh, different uh, bus architecture here that is showed the direct memory uh, access is connected via the direct AHB bus matrix 
and this is the USB and um, as you can see the timers are connected to APB1 and the CRC cyclic redundancy check is connected to HB1 all the ports connected to HB1 and if you want to write a program for ADC or SPI um, use our timer 9, 10 and 11 then you have to use APB2 so as you learned yesterday or the other uh, day with previous sessions if you want to concentrate to write one program then the first thing is you have to enable the peripheral clock that is a must because it it synchronizes with all the other peripherals and tells the microcontroller where it's coming from so that's the key here okay let's get back to our session now let's get into detailed system architecture so this is the uh, bus architecture that uh, we just discussed earlier and uh, this HB advanced high bus peripheral uh, the bus matrix this is the one we are going to see in depth in the uh, in the next one so all these yellow uh, colored ones they are the master devices so the Cortex M4 you have the Ethernet master, you have the iSpeed USB 2, you got the dual port and direct memory access, you got the dual port direct memory access 2. And these are all the, the green ones denotes the slave addresses or the slave devices. The HB1, HB2, uh, static RAM, static RAM 2, FSM, uh, FSMC which uh, stands for um, flexible static memory controller and the uh, that's the external memory this is the internal memory which is the flash and the flash is connected via uh, the bus matrix uh, the blue dot represents there is a connection access from master to system uh, sorry slave and if you if you don't have the blue dots then that means the master wire that line can't be communicated to the slave for example uh, we are learning Cortex M4 architecture. So if you take, for example, the D bus, the data bus, that's the first one. If you want to access um, the any data from SRAM or SRAM2 or external memory, you can use the D bus and it, you can connect and fetch data from these three. Um, so also to the flash memory. Whereas if you take the system bus in here, um, you can't access the flash memory by using a system bus. Um, you can only access to uh, the external um, uh, memory and the SRAM ones. So likewise, if you want to use the high-speed USB, then you need to use the USB and you can only access to SRAMs and the external memory. And the direct memory access, you can access to uh, almost all through these two lines. And this is the one we saw there, the AHB1 advanced high performance bus is connected to a bridge and the bridge is connected to differentiate between the high speed frequency and the low speed frequency um, with the dual port advanced peripheral bus 2 and the advanced peripheral bus 1 where, um, where different parts of the peripherals are connected. So this is how uh, the bus matrix is um, linked with uh, our Cortex M4. Then we learn about the memory map. Uh, so every memory uh, port or peripheral, every peripheral will have a memory address. It's called a boundary address. Boundary address is nothing but boundary as um, in general, when you say boundary, it is a limit. If you take a land, then um, you have the starting point and the end point, and that's the boundary between the start and the end. Likewise, in the memory, you have the starting address of 00, uh, 400 to 000. If you want to use port A, then if you want to use port D, then that's the address 0, 44, uh, 400 to 0, C00 or 0 to double, um, uh, 402. So I'll show you in the reference manual uh, so you will have a better understanding. Uh, reference manual. I'm going to memory mapping to page 37. So this is the memory map uh, we just saw. If you want to use port A, then uh, the memory map 
address the base address starts from 4002 to 4003 ff likewise if you want to say if you want to use i2c then uh, the memory address is 4002 and for an adc the memory address is 4001 so this is the memory map um, that is in the reference manual on page 37 if you go there please read yourselves and um, you will have a better understanding when um, you come here and read so that's the um, boundary addresses for each and every memory map and this is the continuation of the memory map which i just showed you with the uh, different peripherals like i2c usart and uh, timers the every every peripheral will have a starting boundary address starting address i should say and an ending address that's that the regions of the memory map details so when you say the code the instruction fetches and performed over the i i code the instruction code and the data accessed via the d code the d bus code sram instruction fetches and data accesses are performed over the system bus likewise the peripheral instruction fetches and data access by the system bus if you want to access external ram then the instruction fetches and data access are performed by the system bus you can't use data bus or instruction bus so these are all the uh, memory map that uh, from the table from this uh, reference table if you want to see what is the base address of hb bus 1 peripherals it is 0400240 for gpio it is 400240 for rcc reset control clock register the boundary address is or base address is 4002-3800 apb1 it's 4000-000 for a flash internal memory it's 080040s sram it's 2000-400 and the adc register is 0400-1200 again if you go here to the memory access memory map and this is where you will get for gpio port a that's the address and likewise for um, adc that you will just uh, learn 4001022000 so likewise every peripherals hb1 hb2 apb2 APB1 everything will have a boundary address so that's what it's um, saying in this memory map so let's get in to see what the flash memory interface connections looks like as you can see this is the if you go to the reference manual on page 42 this is the diagram you will see on page 42 You scroll further down so this is the diagram i uh, put there in the presentation as you can see if you want to access the flash memory you can access via the i code and the d code the microcontroller can um, communicate via the instruction bus and the uh, data bus and if you want to especially connect to the flash memory you can do so by the instruction bus and the data bus but you can't use a system bus to uh, to access to flash memory but if you want to access um, sram and hp peripheral one um, then um, you have to use the system bus to get to sram whereas the system bus can't access to flash memory so that's the flash memory interface connection inside the architecture so this is how you have to remember when you want to write a program for the um, memory concepts memory interface connection um, i got a small program to explain to you about the bus interface program to interface a bus interface in any c program when you use a const int data equal to ton this is a initialized um, global memory value and the because being it's initialized it can't be changed so that's why we are using on const 
and those memories are stored in the flash memory which is the internal flash and it can't be changed whereas if you create um, data one meaning uh, it's uninitialized you can store it in the ram memory the external because this can be changed so that's why it's stored in the ram and you can access any time um, to it and in the main program when you say data one equal to data this means the data loads from the flash and moves to the sram memory so that's what this line meaning is so if it is a global memory if it is um, initialized memory it will be stored in flash if it is uninitialized memory then it will be roast, um, stored in ram because the values can be changed that's a um, basic of it so if you get into the bus interface how it is connected to the i bus and the d bus arm cortex m4 connects to the flash internal structure via the i bus and the d bus the instruction bus and the d bus the instruction bus is connected to get uh, information from the instructions inside the flash the d bus will be connected to inside flash to get constant data and also internal flash will have vector tables you will learn about vector tables in the further session but this is the internal flash um, architecture if you like in inside the flash these three will be their instructions constant data and vector tables and this is how you communicate with the microcontroller through instruction bus and data bus so if your instructions are present in the memory locations of 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 to FFF FFFC then your processor will fetch the instruction using the I code the instruction bus whereas if it is outside this memory address that that's mentioned there then if you want to fetch the instruction you have to use a system bus for instance if you want to if your data are present in the memory locations of 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000 to one FFF FFFC the processor will fetch the data using the decode the D bus data bus but if it is outside this memory location then you need to use a system bus to fetch the data um, so that's the bus interface now let's see the high speed versus low speed as you saw earlier from the function block diagram um, the functional uh, block diagram the HB bus matrix is connected to a bridge circuit or a bridge um, unit or circuitry if you like and that divides the high speed versus low speed so you have to as a programmer as a system engineer or a software embedded engineer it's your responsibility to see check the data sheet whether you are uh, programming for a high speed peripheral or a low speed peripheral so if you use the high speed peripheral then you have to choose APP2 and that runs on 100 megahertz and say for example if you want to um, write a program for communicating with the USART1 then that's connected to the APB2 whereas if you want to write a program for SPI and I2C2 then that's connected to APB1 on a lower frequency um, speed so you have to use APB1 so that's um, you need to be aware of what peripherals that you're going to communicate to so you understand the bus speed so then you come here and then see whether you have to use high speed or a low speed so please keep that in mind and this functional block diagram always uh, you have to check um, before you jump into writing the code so this is about the high speed and low speed peripherals bus interface I think I could give you a short break and uh, when you come back I will um, show another microcontroller just to give you an example and compare with uh, ARM Cortex M4. So please go and uh, enjoy that break. I will see you back in uh, shortly.
welcome back. I hope um, you have enjoyed that short break uh, to have a bit of a refresher, had a drink and stretch your arms and legs and uh, you're back to learn uh, more. So what's in this session? Um, I'm going to give you a comparison of another microcontroller to STM32. This is from Texas Instrument Tiva. You need to download this Tiva reference manual and uh, I'm comparing with TM4C123GH6PM. Uh, I'm going to go into the data sheet. Um, so just one moment, I downloaded earlier. So this is the TM4C123GH6PM microcontroller data sheet. You need to go to the um, uh, functional block diagram so I can um, show you the the difference of the two microcontrollers. Uh, just give me a moment. Block diagram. Let's see, overview, overview, overview. Let's go in there, process. And this is the overview. I'm trying to get you the functional block diagram so you can um, see, yeah, there it is. Sorry, it is on page, um, page 48, on that manual page 48. Nice. Okay, I hope you can read it now. So it is from Texas Instruments, TM4C123GH6PM. So every microcontroller runs um, on its own bus operating frequency. So the uh, microcontroller, when you say ARM Cortex M4, it its frequency operate operating frequency is 100 megahertz. That's nothing but the system bus. That's what the maximum speed it can run. So likewise. Texas instrument, this one can run only for 80 megahertz, up to 80 megahertz. But the concept and the principle, it's still the same. They use the ARM Cortex M4, um, but the speed, the process speed is different. That's 100 megahertz that we are learning to 80 megahertz. So if you see the structure, this also connects to the bus matrix via the system bus. The flash memory, as we learn from the STM32, if you want to access to the flash memory, you can do so by the D bus and the I code bus. D bus is the data bus, I code bus is the instruction bus. Whereas if you want to connect to SRAM, you can use only the system bus, the S bus. So this one doesn't have a bridge like uh, for us in the STM32, there is the uh, bus matrix is connected to a bridge and the bridge is where it separates from high speed frequency to the low speed, whereas um, the Texas Instruments, this, part, this particular microcontroller doesn't have the bridge. It directly connects to an advanced high performance bus, AHB, and an advanced peripheral bus. The advanced high performance bus is connected, if you want to communicate or interface with DMA, doubly from all the GPOs, then you need to use advanced high performance bus. Whereas if you want to use serial peripherals for UART, I2C, CAN, then you need to use the peripheral bus. Um, so this is the uh, difference between uh, the other microcontroller, STM32, that we are learning to TM4C123. Both works on the same M4 architecture, but different speed. I just want to show you uh, its architecture compared with our learning of STM32 F411. Now let's get into clocks. There are three different clock sources, as you may be all known by now. Um, again, the system clock can be divided into three different clocks. What are they? HSI, HSE, PLL. HSE is high speed internal oscillator clock. HSE is high speed external oscillator clock. Um, which is uh, in some microcontrollers, there will be internal um, clock, uh, actually actual pin will have an internal clock, whereas the 
high speed external clock some pins will have a special functionality so you can use the um, external clock to write to that pin and PLL is the one um, where it takes the low frequency clock and converts to high frequency clock so that's where the PLL is used also these devices will have the following secondary clock sources when you take a internal kilohertz clock the LSI uh, low speed internal RC which drives the independent watchdogs so for example for any real-time clock applications then you use a kilohertz clock whereas in some microcontrollers if you see you have an optional RTC um, the real-time clock um, for the real-time ticker so you use a 32.768 kilohertz clock so that these are all the different clocks that's uh, readily available um, I'm sure I have the schematics to show to you. Just one sec. Uh, schematics data sheet. Is that the schematics? No. Um, just one sec. I'm checking to see where uh, schematics. No, that's not it. I'm just downloading the schematic so I can show it to you just one sec. Okay, so this is the nuclear board that we are using on page two. If you go here, uh, this is page two. You said so that's a TMS T clock. So I'm trying to point out the um, frequency. So this is the RTC clock, 32.78 kilohertz clock. So this is connected to PC 14 and 15. This is for the uh, real time clock uh, that's uh, coming up to connect. Whereas the system clock it comes from the MCO. I think it's on page five as we scroll down. Um, micro what's the extension MCV battery ST clock SP11 okay the clock uh, that we're going to use it's um, a 8 megahertz which it's not applicable so we are not using that the STM nuclear board has its own circuitry that um, um, you get the clock from MCO, which is uh, another circuitry, and that's where the main clock from that you get from the other circuitry. So this is about the schematics. Let's go into here. So what about the clock sources? There is three different uh, clock sources that you can refer to. There is a crystal oscillator, which um, can be external to the MCU. MCU is nothing but microcontroller unit. Um, the crystal oscillator is uh, the one you can um, have as a separate boost um, uh, frequency oscillator for RC oscillators. And you can connect that to the microcontroller via functionality pin, a specific pin. The RC oscillator is internal to the MCU. Some MCU has um, internal built-in um, oscillator, so you don't have to have external clock. It will work in the internal clock. The PLL also uh, internal to the MCU clock source, but this takes the low frequency and converts to high frequency. So that's the PLL best clock load. So what we learned today so far, we learned about different memory maps um, which every peripheral will have a starting address and the ending address and you have learned about how you can fetch uh, any information from um, the flash memory and how you can fetch uh, any information from SRAM. Sometimes with the help of linker scripts you can also um, uh, save or store data information in the SRAM uh, that 
you will learn sometimes through the series i'll show you how otherwise you can also download the header files which already has the peripheral memory map and you can just interface it or otherwise you can also learn to write from scratch so these are all the different um, types there and then you learned about the mcu bus interface there is three different buses the data bus uh, instruction bus and the system bus and how those buses are connected to either um, advanced HB1 or APB1 or APB2 and then you learned about three different clocks the internal clock the external clock and the phase lock lock clock so as I uh, point out early you have to develop your mindset while you're developing your skill set as well so I got this for you for today when you start with a positive mindset thinking positively whatever um, you want to do if you start to think positively all positive things will start to happen so your subconscious mind links to that thinking and only um, um, that process comes whereas when you have negative mindset all negative things will start to happen so your subconscious is um, controlling to negative things so um, oh yeah you can put it off until tomorrow sort of thing so whenever you um, come up with any negative things just throw that away don't get into that just always focus on positivity so because always thinking positive that will lead you to do good things and that will make you as a better person and that will contribute to a better world so everyone including me we i have to start and you have to start to change this world so you need to always think positive and you can do good things when you are in a positive frame of mind and that happened through me uh, with with me and also all my mentors will agree positivity you can do wonders when you are in a positive um, frame of mind also please don't forget about the involvement if um, you follow this through post your achievements into our Facebook so everyone can learn and motivate from each other and uh, we help uh, each other write down your top 10 goals that gives you a point and uh, top 10 ideas to achieve those goals and please try to get 30 minutes at least 30 minutes but uh, please push yourselves to do more than that by by now you should all do at least 10,000 steps as from some of the research uh, um, from medical research people say the more you walk it's better for your own health you lose um, body fat and also it helps all the vital organs to function really well so that's the basic necessity to do workouts especially walking walking helps a lot and also dedicate 15 minutes to meditate or pray and 10 minutes to visualize actually you achieved all your goals so spend at least 10 minutes for that and 10 minutes to plan your daily activities so what are you going to do for the rest of the day or what are you going to do for tomorrow or what is involved for next week and being a beginner level you need at least two hours to grasp everything what i'm showing to you and that gets you two points so the end goal everyone has to try to get 10 out of 10 so please be honest and try to get all of this and post your achievements in facebook group so we learn from each other and uh, we will also take these things forward and there is combo internship coming up as i don't want to cram a lot of information in one area so I divide it into three sections or three modules. We are in the beginner and uh, if you want to learn the whole Cortex M4 series, please also purchase intermediate and advanced from us. So you will have the whole package of uh, Cortex M4. And it is a good investment that you will, um, it is worth a lot. And also this is on the process. There is more internship bundle combo coming up and all this you will be um, uh, getting through and you will be the first person to know once they are um, become available and they will be contacted to um, uh, get that out to you once again I thank you thank you so much for your patience for um, learning through today and please go and uh, have the deserved break that you are after and uh, um, uh, it's been a pleasure to teach you today to show you about the memory map and the uh, bus interface uh, this is Arul Anbukarasu. I'm signing off on behalf of A2DG. Uh, Huru from me and see you 
at the next session until then take care bye 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 for now